They called them angels of mercy. They were those no-nonsense women in the starched white uniforms and caps, the ones who changed the bandages as well as the bed linens, who administered the medicine as well as the words of comfort, the ones who attended the doctors but never forgot to inform the patient's family about what was going on. They were the nurses of Frick Hospital, Latrobe Hospital, and Westmoreland Hospital, who studied and worked within their community, persevering against great odds in the name of healing. Westmoreland Hospital opened its School of Nursing in 1896, immediately following the hospital's formal dedication, with an initial enrollment of six candidates. This training program spanned 78 years, graduating its final class in 1975. In total, 1,340 nurses earned their caps from Westmoreland. Henry Clay Frick Memorial Hospital was established in 1902. The nurses' training school was organized in October of 1904, with three nurses graduating in 1907 in its first class. In the school's 46-year history, 310 students were admitted, with 244 earning their diplomas. When the hospital marked its centennial in 2002, 48 nursing school graduates called from the classes of 1939 through the school's closing in 1950 were there to celebrate their legacy. In Latrobe, the School of Nursing was one of the most important issues related to establishing a community hospital in 1910. Enrolling its first students in 1917, the school provided critically needed staff to run the hospital with more than 700 graduates to its credit the hospital entered into an affiliation with Indiana University of Pennsylvania in 1971 and graduated its last class. How was it back then? Nurses lived at the hospital and 24-hour duty was part of the regular routine. When the nurses weren't caring for the patients, they were assigned other unrelated chores, sweeping and mopping floors, cleaning lamp chimneys, and fetching coal. Dining, housing, and food services were available, but recreation or social gatherings were unheard of. Nurses wore floor-length blue and white stripes, long-sleeved uniforms sporting tight-fitting cuffs with hair pulled tightly on their heads. Our first uniform, I, was, I didn't have a first uniform to, to bring, but it wasn't bad because, you know, it was, I think we were around the first time that we didn't have to wear black stockings. We always wore caps. All during my nursing career, I wore a cap. Well, pants then, oh, no, that's another thing, <laughs> pants. That came in too later in my career. I think they, they liked to see the nurse with her uniform on. I don't think I ever wore pants during nursing, during a nursing career, but I did streetwear. You looked like a nurse when you had <laughs> your uniform on. But my uniform was always white. They literally lived to care for the sick solely, according to one account about the restricted lifestyles of nurses at Westmoreland Hospital. Nursing school students were prohibited from smoking, nor were they permitted to have their hair styled at a beauty salon. They worked from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily, except Sunday, when they got some time off from noon to 2 p.m. And the nurses who excelled were rewarded with a weekly night off for courting purposes. After serving for five years in a faithful and flawless manner, they were entitled to receive a five cent a day pay increase. Student nurses were involved in World War I, the 1918 flu pandemic, treating the injured and dying victims of several catastrophic train wrecks and staffing the hospitals at the beginning of the Great Depression. What motivated women to pursue this path? I always wanted to be, and it's like, I always like to take care of somebody, even at home. So that was my interest, just to take care of people. Well, my mother was definitely for it. She encouraged me all the way. Our family was different because my father died young. He was 30, died in the coal mine. So that left my mother to take care of five children. And 
so she helped us along all she could. I left high school for a year to earn a little money to help pay for my entrance fee and that because it was like well, 300 and some dollars that I had to pay to enter the field of nursing in Lake Trobe. And so I worked a little odd jobs just to make a little extra money to help my mother along. I graduated from high school 34, so I lived a whole year free and uh, that was it. World War II impacted the schools of nursing in many ways. The Army promised that the young woman who administers to our fighting men is playing a vital role in the battle for freedom. The pitch was enough to inspire dozens of women to join the cadet nursing program as the first step toward enlisting in the U.S. military. One nurse in our class who left the training course to enter the service. Of course, then when she finished with her service duties, she went back into nursing to finish her course. So she, she became a nurse then. After the war, Licensing requirements began to increase the standards for training and graduating qualified nurses. Class size more than doubled, and the career track included coursework more clearly tailored to a college degree program. In the 1940s, Martha Marks, a seasoned veteran of Westmoreland Hospital's nursing program and the hospital's first personnel director, arranged an affiliation with Seton Hill College that offered School of Nursing students college credit courses for the first time. St. Vincent College was likewise a source of classes for the Latrobe students. At Westmoreland, groundbreaking was held in June 1961 for a new School of Nursing building. Home for 96 nursing students, the structure housed classrooms, an auditorium, kitchens, television lounges, and living quarters. In 1965, two male students were accepted into the nursing program. When they were enrolled, the school had 48 women. The 1940s and the decades that followed were times of great change, and Mildred Panigal was one such nurse working through that change. She graduated from the Latrobe Hospital School of Nursing, class of 1938, and began her career on the maternity ward. Millie worked in the operating room for three years, then accepted assignment to the emergency room, where she remained until her retirement, watching the department grow from one room to its 15-room complement. Well, I just liked the sickly, and I did like uh, nursery. I wasn't into emergency room till after I graduated, really. If they needed someone to work here, they'd send me. If they needed somebody to help out in this section, that you know, if I was free and available, I would help out there. So that's how I got into the emergency room. I didn't train for it, but uh, it was just part of the course. We had mine accidents, farm accidents, uh, just more vehicle accidents. Millie was a volunteer with the Chestnut Ridge chapter of the American Red Cross for 25 years arranging for volunteer nurses to staff blood mobile visits across the community and first aid stations for everything from the local 4th of July celebrations to the Rolling Rock races. She was also instrumental in setting up the civil defense program. If they needed somebody to help in a certain situation, I might have been available to help because most of the other nurses in the class left, you know, when they were finished nursing. Some. One or two stayed around, some went into private duty and things like that, so I was handy. That's how I got involved in more things. I was just available. The nurse-doctor relationship was important to Millie. Dr. Hamill, he was number one. <laughs> he was there and he, he, was, he was a good doctor. He was a good surgeon. He was good for fractures. But they were all, they all had their goodness about them. I could diagnose a lot of patients. I think I could. <laughs> but you needed help, you know. You, you couldn't rely on just a person like me. But, uh, but you do, you know, you do go through those periods where 
<clears throat> when you see somebody and take their life signs and realize that they do have maybe appendicitis or a fracture. You can almost tell a fracture by the looks of it. But those things come to you. I'd give it to them too. Mostly see the doctor. <laughs> Check with your doctor. Oh, well, you need help some days. You need help along the way. In 1965, Millie earned the distinction of being named Citizen Nurse by the Allstate Insurance Company. Along with the honor, the award brought scholarship funds for the hospital's School of Nursing. At her retirement dinner, Millie had her parking card returned to her because she planned to become an involved volunteer. That involvement is a way of life for Millie and one of the many reasons the Nurses Association honored her with the Harriet S. Mauling Award in 1976. The closing of our nursing schools was unavoidable at a time of change in both medicine and education. It became abundantly clear that the national trend was to include in college and university programs the training for nursing careers, a more efficient option than each hospital could provide. But no matter the year or the circumstance, excellence was and continues to be a hallmark for those who choose the nursing profession. Their legacy lives on. Our mission is mercy to all mankind. To this we dedicate our hearts and minds. With honor and courage, with humility, we pledge our professional ability.